Greetings, everyone. This is Rock and Roll Spot Connection with the return of my retro review series on the Vertigo title, 100 Bullets. So, about a year and a half ago, or more than a year ago, less than two years ago, let's put it that way, um, I began the series going over the first volume of uh, 100 Bullets. Last year, uh, things in that in the time since the first video, things got a little busy, things got a little hectic. I got a little down and out because reasons, and uh, yeah, so the the series got put on the back burner unintentionally. However, the time has come to bring it back because hey kind of at a shortage when it comes to uh, potential content right now. So, Split Second Chance, 100 Bullets, Volume 2. So, okay, the way we're going to be going through the trade is first I'll be doing the three short vignette type stories. These were initially printed as single or either a single issue or double issue stories. There's kind of, a, you know, Little story involving Agent Graves. They and it didn't so much tie into the overarching plot of the series, but it did. It basically showed Graves doing well what Graves does, and if for those who are unaware or just forgot, what Agent Graves does is he 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 likes to play a game with people. He'll find those who are kind of, you know, maybe, we'll say a little down and out. You know, um, the hard luck, the people that are hard, that are, you know, just hard out in their luck, and, you know, things ain't going well for them. He gives them a briefcase. In that briefcase is a handgun, 45 to be exact, the titular 100 bullets as well as verifiable proof that your situation is actually because of the actions of someone uh, and basically a file saying, you know, this is who whose fault your situation is. Um, as well as kind of a here's the rundown of all that. You know, Yes, uh, you know, kind of like, yes, it sounds crazy, but no, here's actual, you know, this person, you know, did this, did this, did this, because of all these, you know, this happened, and, yeah. So, but yeah, that, we'll be handle it, covering the vignette type stories first. Then we'll move on to the primary stories. So, speaking of the vignettes, we'll start off with short con long odds. Short con long odds begins with a with a flashback. Um, a couple of kids throwing dice. One of them talking about how he uh, saw a thing on TV about a guy about a guy who you know threw dice a, a certain way. See the two kids being Chucky and Pony. Chucky being the one talking about the way. You know, you, roll, you, throw, you hold the dice a certain way before you roll them, you know, you're good. Cut to now. Chuggy's playing dice, he's rolled snake eyes. Little game of dice, but back behind, you know, a bunch of trucks. Uh, he's not exactly doing that well. But he gets one more roll. Gets a seven. So he lets it roll, right. Gets another one. Tries it one more thing. Yeah, gets another set. He's cleaning up and. And suddenly his girl shows up. Mad as hell at Chucky for. For playing. For gambling away. What money they got. They drive off and reveals it was all a con. The idea being, Chucky, you know, 
Chucky start. Chucky plays the plays the guys, gets them confident, wins wins some money off them. Then Shantae, his girl, shows up and basically you know and gets him out of there and plays plays the part of the uh, pissed off girlfriend so that before he has a chance to let everyone win their money back. But apparently he's been having trouble finding games, and really this is all he can find these little pickup games. Nothing too big. But he's all part of it being he's trying to he owes some money and well he's trying to pay that back. And he goes to Baby Maxwell, the bookie he owes money to. And, you know, makes basically, hey, here's a payment, you know. But turns out Baby Maxwell sold Chucky's marker. Turns out Maxwell sold it to Pony, Chucky's old friend. Which, of course, makes Chucky feel even worse because it was one thing to owe Maxwell. Because, you know, hey, meant he had, you know, yeah, he had to pay up. But with Pony, Pony's a friend. You know, I mean, there's, there, with Maxwell, Chucky knew he would have to, you know, he could never play that, hey, I, I couldn't get, uh, you know, uh, I can't really stretch. I know I, I, in the hole, and I, I, I still, I'll, I'll get you. Just you know, had a tough, had a tough moment. And Maxwell told him, "Nah, screw that. No, fuck that. You owe, you owe me money. You owe me money." Pony, however, being Chucky's friend, is more likely to say, "Hey, man, I understand. I totally get you. Now you pay me when you can. Don't worry about it." <laughs> And so, Chucky goes to talk, to talk with Pony, and Pony basically says that, you know, he, he tore up Chucky's marker. He bought it and got rid of it. Pony doesn't owe him anything. And Pony's also trying to, you know, say, hey, look. You know, it's kind of spreading that you're a cheat, okay? Don't get it, you know, so maybe you should stop playing. But Chucky insists on paying, so. And he you know, plays the same thing. But he gets found out. And as as the guys he's playing with or start rolling him, start rolling Chucky, well. Graves shows up. And saves Chucky's ass. Briefcase in hand. And Graves tells him a story about. Well, and he also has a, he has a picture of Pony as well because apparently Graves is looking for Pony. Shows a po picture to Chucky, but no, Chucky has never even seen him. However, Graves tells him a story. The story being that about eight years previously, Pony was involved in a, a car accident. He and a friend of his, they were drunk, slammed into another car, and he killed a couple of kids on a date. But what really gets Graves isn't that they did that. It's what happened next. This friend of Pony's, he took the fall. Because 
Because apparently that friend forgot that when him and Pony left the bar that night, Pony was driving. Pony switched places with his friend. And poor guy did seven years for a vehicular homicide. Wasn't even his fault. However, now things are going worse. I mean, this friend's a gambler, you know? So Pony's spreading word that the guy's a cheat. Of course, the story is all about the friend of Pony's in the story is Chucky. And with that, Graves gives Chucky the briefcase. And moving on to Ponies having dinner with Shantae. And at the same time, Chucky's playing pool with uh, one of the pool walls when baby Maxwell comes in. Turns out Maxwell's got a job. Apparently it's a big score. A game that uh, Max was running that night. Out of town business, you know, like throw around cash, big spenders. Well, someone stopped by and offered to very generously bank the house as long as the business, the Japanese businessmen lose. And Shantae tries to talk some sense and that night before the before the game, Shantae tries to talk some sense and the Chucky say, Hey, look, you know, you've got Pony Torque your marker, you have an out. You don't have to keep hustling. But the way Chucky sees it, if he does that, he's a loser. And so at the game that night, everything seems to be going well. Turns out that the mysterious gentleman bankrolling the house is none other than Mr. Shepard. A former associate of Mr. Graves, of Agent Graves. But something has, something has spooked Chucky. One of the uh, businessmen is, well, is holding. Gun for a shootout begins. Maxwell, Japanese businessman, everyone in the club except for Chucky, dead. Well, Maxwell calls for anything up to, to come help. Pony, only one he calls. Shantae answers the phone. So Chucky goes to see Pony, basically shooting his way in, blasting up his operation, killing more a few members of uh, killing some members of Chucky's crew. So Pony goes to meet Chucky. Do them talk. And 
and then they kill each other. Shantae sitting in Chucky in Pony's car hearing the gunshots. So next up, we got, next thing that we got is called Day Hour Minute Man. We're down to Florida. Agent Graves talking with a uh, basically getting money to a drug dealer. Or to getting some money from a drug dealer, I should say. And he passes on a little bit of uh, information. Up in Detroit, uh, there's a you know, there's a, a bit of an opening in uh, for bookies. You know, so we're, if someone wanted to move in and um, make a play for some turf, well, now would be the perfect time to do so. And so, Graves leaves. No, apparently it was all. It was, he was playing. He was playing the dealers, and nods the cops outside, who then rushed the place, killing the drug dealers, and uh, before well, Graves goes for a coffee. He's met by Lano. Now, technically, this is the, the introduction to Lano, though. I, if I remember correctly, he shows up at the very near the very end of the first volume of the, of the first trade. Um, Lano, Lano's nuts, plain and simple. He he just enjoys to kill him. Former Minuteman, probably the only, and he, as far as he knows, him and Gray are the only Minutemen still alive. And well, Shepard sold them out. Well, it turns out that the briefcase of money from, that Gray's just got is for Lana. So he pat you know gives gives Lana the money and. Uh, Explain that Shepard actually won, the Minutemen survived, and Shepard actually helped arrange their survival. So, in fact, Shepard went so far as to tell the Trust that the Minutemen were all dead. And so Lano goes on with the money. Also, it's a, also Graves reveals to Lano that he activated one of the Minutemen in Chicago just the previous month. But Lano takes his leave of Graves, and. Uh, the young, the young waitress who, who's, who's been, you know, covering, who's been serving graves, uh, he explain, Grave explains to her that uh, Manny just, they just left the table. Well, he's leaving with two million dollars in cash, and so the waitress tells her boyfriend. And, uh, Graves pays the check, leaves a nice tip. We learn that Shepard's been listening in the entire time. And Lano passes by, unknowingly passes by Shepard as 
Waitress's girlfriend and his buddies roll up on him. That's where the story ends. Moving on. Well, actually, we're actually going to skip a little bit. This is the third vignette story. Heartbreak. Sunny side up. So it begins in a, you know, small town, you know, normal home. A couple getting ready for their day. Man works days, woman, work, woman works nights. She's a waitress. She stops briefly in her, in her daughter's room. And then heads out to work. There's the usual work stuff. But there's a... However, Graves walks in. With the briefcase. Somehow, and knows. Lily Roach, our, our waitress. She wonders just how it is that he knows her. And he explains that it's because he knows her daughter. And so. He explains that uh, the last time he he saw Lily's daughter was four years ago. And or the last time that Lily saw her daughter was four years ago, and she'd done a lot of li living since then. And, well, yeah. Her daughter overdosed. Basically, her, her daughter's dead. Uh, and Lily is learning this on what would have been her daughter's 16th birthday. And so, Graves gives the, yeah, the briefcase, explaining that inside she will find a refutable evidence that what he's told her is true. There's a gun, 100 rounds of untraceable line ammunition. And so, after her shift ends, Lily goes home, puts the 45 from the briefcase beside her head, and then her husband wakes up, Phil. And they talk about how he's not supposed to sleep in his chair, the doctor said. And she adds that uh, she met a man that night. Gave, gave her the picture of a stranger. She proceeds to then presumably put all 100 bullets into Phil. And it turns out that Phil had been... Yeah since baby since Tina was seven years old. And Graves walks by the house during the cacophony of uh, gunfire and looks briefly and keeps walking. And that is where that story ends. Now we move on to the overarching plot stories. First off is the right ear left in the cold. We begin with a bunch of uh, kids in an ice cream truck. Uh, 
the ice cream man, of course, meet a guy named Cole. Cole also sells cigarettes out of his, uh, cigarettes for the parents out of his ice cream truck. Keep in mind, this is, you know, like the mid 90s. But, uh, Agent Graves stops by and gets a nutty gets a, a nutty buddy, leaving the briefcase. However, Cole tells him, "Hey, you left the briefcase." But Graves says, "No, no, no. it's your briefcase." So you know the, your Cole burns, right? We got the gun, we got the ammo, we got the magazine. Picture of a man named Goldie. Goldie Petrovich, a small time racketeer, two time savage. As, to quote, to directly quote Agent Graves, a real brute who's managed to elude the authorities for years now, mostly because the hoods that work for him swear they don't. Graves then implies that Cole worked, that Cole worked for Goldie. And Graves asked Miss Swarno's grandmother's grave, and well, that's a bit of a that's a that's a bit of a nerve. He explains this he's done explaining that Goldie died at, or that Cole's grandmother died about a year ago. Her and forty other senior citizens trapped in a burning nursing home. Nothing could be done about it. Well, Cole couldn't do anything about it. He was in prison at the time. And so Graves just, you know, you're out, you're out now, so you can do something about it, right? However, Cole is like, what can I do? Graves asks, hey, you know, dig around in the file. Maybe, you know, you'll find evidence that the fire didn't start itself. With Graves straight saying, it was Goldie holding the match. And so an associate of Goldie's sees Cole reading through the file and throws, throws a baseball at him, which he catches and throws back. Cole gets home and spends some time with his with his girl. And Sasha, Cole's girlfriend, wants to get married, but uh, you know. Maybe suggests he get he does nothing more than just sell stolen cigarettes out of his, out of his ice cream truck. But it turns out another truck's going by it in his area, and so Cole goes after the other ice cream because hey, you know, you, everyone's got their their area, everyone's got their turf, and well, this guy is uh, encroaching on Cole's turf, so Cole takes his keys and chucks them into a, in the sewer. So, Cole goes to talk to Goldie. And actually tells him, you know, yeah, someone actually came up to me and, you know, tried, basically tried to put, point me in your direction with a loaded gun. And 
secretly torturing someone. But Cole also gets confirmation. Yeah, Goldie lit that lit, lit the nursing home on fire. However, as the person being tortured is being tortured, he briefly says the word Croatoa, which briefly causes Cole to kind of freeze. With three guns in his face. After that, however, when he comes to, everyone in the room is dead but him, including Goldie, and he's been shot in the arm. Sasha talks to him, freaked when he gets home. Sasha talks to him, freaked out when he, he reveals he was shot. And so Cole begins looking for graves. However, instead he finds Shepard. However, he has he's I'm trying to remember some things, but he at least knows that Grave. So Gra Shepard and Cole talk a bit. Turns out Shepard's the one who actually set him up with the ice cream man job. Thought that Cole would enjoy making children happy. However, not that the other ice cream man from earlier, Laszlo, is, is has rolled Cole's ice cream truck and inadvertently started a fire. And so Cole remembers. Basically pouring gas on someone and lighting them ablaze. And so, rather than kill Laszlo, Cole simply says, you know, Fine, you know, you're gonna put me out of business? Okay, fine. Here's what you need to know. Tells them all about the kids in the area. You know, who, want, who likes what? How to deal with them. And then Cole leaves with Shepard. Who takes him to graves. Turns out that Cole doesn't remember everything, but more just image, images and pieces, images and bits and pieces. Though Graves assures him that it'll all come back to him. Then we see what actually happened when it came to when Cole took out the uh, got Gold and his men. Turns out that uh, Graves gave the Graves gave the guy who said Croatoa five hundred bucks to say it upon seeing Cole, and that it might save his life if he did. Cole makes it very clear, yeah, he's, leaving, he's left Sasha having 
it's like a knife in a phone pole or in a telephone pole through a through an engagement ring. And graves and and the story ends with graves and and Cole riding off together. Now we have the final portion of the portion. Parle Parle Kung Vu. Um, oh. What was her name? Ah, uh, yes. Parlay Kung Vu, we meet back up with Dizzy Cordova from Volume, who was the protagonist of the bulk of the first Hunter Bullets trade. Dizzy was, is the Minuteman man who was previously who was reactivated in Chicago by Graves. However, now she's in Paris. She's been Having been sent there by Graves, I told her to look for, look for my name, Mr. Branch. So, she goes. Mr. Branch likes to watch street fights and doesn't always pick the right fighter to bet on. So, on his way home from, from such a fight, Picks up some food and uh, is found by Dizzy. Oh, it's Shepard that sent her that sent her, her to him, not Graves. And so the two of them have dinner and. Well, Branch immediately figures that Shepard sent Dizzy to kill him. And Dizzy explains that she's been sent not to kill him, but because Shepard thought that her and Branch would have a lot in common. And what they have in common is the, att is the attaché case. And so Branch tells his story. He's a reporter. He started at. He heard rumors and he started looking into it. As along their walk, Branch is attacked. But Dizzy makes it very clear that, well, not ideal to attack someone with her. As her story, as his story goes. He lit Basically, he's he's living in Paris to escape from his past. And so, it was like he was a reporter. And he was, when he was given the case, he decided to look it up. No agency on record had him. So he took the gun to a so he took the gun to a cop friend of his. Turns out the gun was registered. The gun was registered and Branch had nothing to worry about. So in the middle of a park one day he shot a dog. 
and nothing happened. We have the cops to show. Two hours later, he was given the gun back, and he was out on the street like nothing ever happened. And that scared Branch. So he started digging even deeper. Which he kind of saw as he never, he never realized he was digging his own grave. So, but he also doesn't dig into Dizzy as well. He's just asking her questions. How it is she knows Shepard, and he she explains that Shepard picked her up after she did the job that Gabe Graves gave her. The guy that uh, tried to roll Branch comes comes into the bar, and. She leaves to the bathroom briefly and turns out Branch has been pulled outside. Now she's going to have to do a bit of fighting and, well, yeah. She wins the fight quite clearly. And seeing as how he bet on her, well, yeah. Turns out she has quite a few uh, fighting styles. They continue talking, and Branch insists they're both victims of a big con. And he talks about the trust, explaining that the trust is very old, very powerful, very dirty, and has been around for next to forever. However, did he? It's like I have yeah, never heard of him. Which is because they don't want her, don't they? She don't want anyone to know about them. She then asks, well, how do you know? So he mentioned, goes back to his story about how he did some digging on his own. And what he found was a cop, as he puts it, is a coffin full of pieces from a hundred jigsaw puzzles. But he kept, he said he was going to try and put them all together. As pieces began to fall together, Came across a report from Omaha. So he gets on a plane, heads out to Omaha. He goes to talk to a man about eating grapes. He says, the guy says, you know, I don't know any of grapes. But I do know about peace. But, you know, let's say I did know an ancient graves. I'd like to, I'd like to say thank you. Which made Branch realize he wasn't the only person to be to get the offer from Graves. And this of course led to him asking more questions. And he continues to go on explaining the truck. <coughs> The trust is the original, original gangsters. And that the trust had a group of enforcers, Minutemen, of which Graves is the leader. And he goes on explaining that, you know, Graves sold her at least part of the truth. However, things continued. In his story, someone showed up to, uh... Someone showed up and started smacking Branch around in his office, asking about the attaché, breaking fingers...
and explaining that uh, kind of why Graves does what he does. It's also when Branch met Shepard. He explained that they're very powerful people who know of Agent Graves, but turn a bl blind eye to his indulgences. And Branch, in his investigations, got too close to them. But Shepard explain Shepherd explains to him why truth, justice, and the American way have no, no business being in the same sentence, and about the trust. You know, they're walking through Paris. They run into coal. Branch. Because that still has the gun that Graves gave him. Man, Branch. No, we realized that Cole had been uh, tailing them since this, since that morning. And he explains that, you know, the Minute... Cole explains to, Tra to Branch and Dizzy that the Minutemen, they don't work for the Trust. They work for Graves. Just Graves. And so, Cole explains that uh, Minutemen did something huge, and the Trust decided they wanted a repeat performance. Graves said no. And she, and Branch basically says, you know, He needs to, she, Dizzy needs to tell Shepard that she belongs to Graves. And with that, he bid, says au revoir and runs off into the night. And that is 100 Bullets Volume 2, Split Second Chance. Hopefully, we'll be getting to Volume 3 in a much more timely manner than we did, than we did Volume 2. Um, obviously, with current events being what they are, um, yeah, I, some of my segments are going to, are going to be going on temporary hiatus. Movie reviews, potentially speaking, retro, re, retro movie reviews, building the team, those are currently all on hiatus for the moment. But as soon as I'm able to, as soon as I'm able to do them again, they'll be back. Anyway, as always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal can be found in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off saying, Live long, rock hard, and stay safe, everyone.